Um, very, very humbled to be here and, and, and just what a wonderful day it's been in terms of listening to women being respectful, women being honest, win, women being ourselves. And I think this discussion really is about what do we mean by equality and what do we mean by a safe space online and, and really about being inclusive and about being, um, about being true to ourselves. And I wanted to start actually with Shilpa. If I could ask you, you're an author um, and also a professor, and tell us a little bit about why loiter. What does loitering mean? What does it even mean in the public space? And what could it mean online? Thanks so much, Shelley. Um, so we, uh, I and two of my colleagues, uh, Samira Khan and Shilpa Ranade, wrote a book. It was. It is called Why Loiter Women and Risk on Mumbai Streets. And we began researching women's access to public space, focusing on Mumbai. And one of the things that struck us really was that as women or as girls get older, their access to public space contracts, whereas boys, as they become men, their access to public space expands. And the na narrative in which women access public space is always one of danger. It's like the public is dangerous. We know from research and data that women's homes are as dangerous or if not more dangerous. But nobody tells women not to be at home. It's always the public space that's seen to be dangerous for women. And so we began to argue that for women to have access to public space, what they needed was not conditional safety. Safe con safety conditional upon you being respectable, upon you having a purpose in public space, but rather the right to take risks, which is not that nobody should attack you because we argued that no place is safe, not even your home. But that when you do, or if you are attacked, nobody should question your right to be there. So when women walk out into the streets, and if you get hit by a bus, various kinds of medical legal processes will begin, right? But if you walk out onto the streets and you get sexually assaulted, before anything else can happen, people will begin to ask you why you were there, what you were doing, whom you were with, what you were wearing, and that's really the kind of idea we were beginning to fight against. And we moved from risk to loitering, which is we then argued that women are often told don't be in public space because there are unemployed men, because there are Muslim men, because there are hawkers, because there are sex workers, and people will say you're a sex worker. And so we began to argue that not just women, but everybody must have the unconditional right to loiter in public space, including those who might not be seen as being friendly to women. Only then could everybody have access to public space as citizens. And really, this is, this is the core of what we're trying to say, that it's a right of citizenship. Shreya, um, the right of citizenship. You, um, as editor of Skin Stories, you are also taking a community into this space. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, as, as, as Shilpa has, has outlined, and, ha and how you have been able to create um, a community online? Thanks, Shelley. Um, so I edit a weekly digital publication called Skin Stories, which stands at the intersection of sexuality, disability, and gender. And um, we're online because we feel like the online space, you know, we often assume that it's a neutral space, assumes a neutral user. But usually the neutral user in mind is, is the most privileged user you can imagine. So a cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied man who's upper caste and upper class and has access. So, you know, when we do feminist politics online, we, we talk a lot about intersectionality. So we talk about how this neutral user is actually a figment of our imagination. Or if they exist, they, they get the most privileged kind of uh, experience of the online space. Whereas offline hierarchies are replicated online for all marginalized people. So with disability particularly in mind as a highly underrepresented category, we at the Sexuality and Disability Program at this nonprofit called Point of View, where I work, started Skin Stories a year ago to amplify the voices of people with disabilities, particularly women and non-binary people. Because we feel like, um, you know, the people with disabilities can be sexual beings just like anyone else. And we start from that premise. And that is often uh, 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 like a disability, aspect of disability activism that is ignored by both the feminist movement and the disability rights movement. And this intersection is very, very important because it touches upon the intimate lives of people with disabilities. 
and we didn't want to speak for them. We wanted people with disabilities to have this conversation on their own. And through that myth, you know, bust the myth of the neutral user that includes people with disabilities saying what the barriers to access are to online spaces. So if an online space is inaccessible to someone, uh, we also try to facilitate that conversation. So within the realm of citizenship, we, we testify very strongly that people with disabilities exist and that we have a voice. And that's what we're trying to amplify. Anju, voice, um, I'm sure, in, in, your, in your work um, is, is crucial because you are really helping Dalit women have a voice, and, and not only online, but offline as well. Can you tell me about your experience of social media and whether this is, this is working? I mean, are, are, is social media making an impact for, um, for people who have a marginalized voice? Yes, uh, uh, social media is uh, really making impact in our work uh, because uh, social media is given us so much. Uh, as all know that uh, uh, mainstream media doesn't cover an issue. So we uh, have created our own platform on the social media to write our story, our narratives, and our perspectives. So, uh, in our perspectives, um, it gives both the things, positive and negative also. If we see that social media ke through, we get a backlash bhi hum logo ko milta hai. Uh, abhi recently you will have seen that very uh, powerfully our uh, Dalit sisters have uh, smashed Brahminical Patriarchy poster which uh, uh, Jack has given around how much uh, conversation and how much it has created. So, this is a backlash that comes from the community, the Dalit women comes directly and individually also comes on our own. But still, our young Dalit leaders, the Dalit young Dalit leaders, the Dalit young Dalit leaders, have made this hard work with hard work. We have created this space with hard work and we have created this space with hard work. हम सभी जानते हैं कि दलित महिलाओं के लिए कुछ भी इजी नहीं है हमें कोई ऐसे प्लेट में सर्व करके कुछ नहीं देता है जो भी हम कर रहे हैं अपने से कर रहे हैं हमने खुद क्रिएट किया है वो ऑनलाइन स्पेस जहां पर हम अपनी स्टोरीज अपने ढंग से रख सकते हैं अपने तरीके से कह सकते हैं क्योंकि हमने पास में भी बहुत देखा है कि जब भी कोई दूसरे लोग और सवर्ण महिला और सवर्ण समाज हमारी स्टोरीज को लिखता है तो वो अपने पर्सपेक्टिव से उसको लिखता है but हम अभी हम लोगों ने वो space create किया है online space को digital media को हम लोग अपने तरीके से use कर रहे हैं और अपनी stories को बाहर ला रहे हैं तो yes positive impact भी बहुत ज़्यादा है हमारा जो handle है दलित hashtag दलित में fight अभी उसपे more than twenty thousand followers है और बहुत proud के साथ हम लोग कह सकते हैं कि हम लोगों ने उसको पूरा बनाया है और और यस डेफिनेटली हम उस स्पेस को बिल्कुल नहीं छोड़ने वाले हैं। I should say that I I don't speak great Hindi but I do I do understand and I and I and I also want to then take that into in, in, talking about barriers to access and a lot of that is around mis misperception and we know for a fact that women in India don't have access to smartphones therefore the penetration of of be, the by virtue of that being on virtual reality, being, being online is, 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 is very different to, to how, a ma to how me men in this country um, you know, use online. And, and tell, me, tell me a little bit about how this also impacts yes. on... If I talk uh, about the barriers, so uh, there is a several type of barriers. Uh, one is language, mm. because uh, most of our people uh, speak Hindi or local language. So, uh, social media is highly dominated by English speaking uh, people. So, uh, language is a barrier. So, whatever we write in Hindi, so it get less coverage. If you write in English, it get more coverage. So, uh, language is a barrier. And yes, uh, technology se or her resources se hamare logo ko dur rakha gaya hai, hamari mahilao ko dur rakha gaya hai. But humne uh, wo koshish ki hai ki, matlab, स्मार्टफोन को हम लोग ऑपरेट कर सके और हम लोग बहुत हार्डली ट्राई कर रहे हैं कि टेक्नोलॉजी को हम लोग ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा सीखें और अपनी महिलाओं को अपनी यंग लड़कियों को ट्रेन करें कि वो स्मार्टफोन का यूज़ करें और जो भी टेक्नोलॉजी अवेलेबल है अभी वो उस 
मतलब उसको फुली मतलब हैंड होल्डिंग उनको दे रहे हैं ट्रेनिंग्स दे रहे हैं और वो उस सब को सीख कर फुली एक्यूप्ड होकर इस प्लेटफॉर्म को फुली एक्वायर करें Shubhak, maybe you could also add a little bit about how does it champion or, or amplify some of the gaps that we see. I actually think it's interesting to to use the metaphor of lo loitering again to look at online spaces because just as women and other ma ma marginal citizens who may not have access to public space want to loiter in public space, they we also want to loiter online. And there's a particular pleasure of moving from one side to another, of engaging, of doing things that might not be. Uh, sort of seen as all right, walking into porn sites, chatting with people, being anonymous, playing different kinds of avatars, and I think women want very much to loiter online. What happens quite often is you get trolled, you get stalked, you get threats, and what often then happens is that just like in public space, you are told don't go out, you are told don't go online, and this is not really the answer because we find that when women are stalked and then uh, when they go to the police, the police want their phones. And one of the things women don't want to do is give up those phones because even if those phones are the instrument through which people stalk them through their use of social media, for instance, women also find great pleasure and great freedom in being online, in accessing those spaces. And I think we do need to, when we look at online space and when we look at questions of access, also look at questions of pleasure. That it is extremely pleasurable, and unlike in public space, you don't have to worry what you're wearing, you don't have to worry whether you're respectable enough, you know. And there's there's a possibility of being somebody else. You don't always have to. The internet offers possibilities to be somebody else. And I think that we do need to think of how we can create a feminist infrastructure on the net where all of us can explore pleasure and be safe at the same time. I feel like you know that that we should not have to take risks we don't choose, but we should also simultaneously be free to choose. Risks we want to take, but not be forced to take risks because uh, there is continuous hate speech, or when we report someone, it's not taken cognizance of. Treya, how can how what experiences do you have of, of having fun online and and also through skin stories? What what um, lessons have, or testimonies have, have have people told you about this is a positive experience? We want it to generate a positive behaviour, and that's therefore we need to work much more closely you know, with different partners, with different groups, we need to listen and we need to be much more adaptive as well. I'm going to speak from the lens of skin stories. Um, technology is a very complicated space for people with disabilities because those who have access to it have found great uh, spaces for community building, friendship, even romance, even connection through things like a WhatsApp group. So a group of visually impaired people on a WhatsApp group will send each other voice notes, for example or people like me who live with chronic illness or, or mental uh, health issues find other support groups where they talk to each other because the medical establishment uh, 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 continuously fails us. So finding that space online has been really, really powerful. At the same time, there are some very basic things that uh, web developers could be doing that they're not for accessibility. So for example, my colleague Nidhi Goel, who uh, lives with disability, says she can't book her show. She can't go on, uh, you know, she can't go on a simple app and it's fairly simple to add image descriptions, for example, to make an app or a website more accessible. But developers, because they're not thinking about the user with disability, which goes back to my earlier point about the myth of the neutral user. You're assuming the user is able to access you already. Where you should actually, you know, making a simple, following simple developing, uh, developer guidelines could lead to a far more accessible experience for someone with disability. Um, so it's a minefield, you know, and it has both, uh, as Shilpa says, as, uh, as all of us have said at some level, it has both risks and possibilities. It has both dangers and, and great, uh, uh, you know, problems as well. And we're constantly navigating those. So making space for those is extremely important. And part of that is accessibility. Part of that is recognizing that communities of us exist online. It's not just a certain kind of person. It's all of us, you know. And that is, it's, it's a two-way communication, clearly. When, just to come back, my final question is, is about community. We, we've heard a lot about very unique platforms, platforms for people with disability, platforms for people who are from a, from a specific creed or caste. Do you think, though, that when we talk about equality, that we need to be moving in a direction of much more inclusive, 
being more inclusive, being more equal, that we all, do you think that it's important that communities know where to go online for support, for, like you say, that, you know, that, that, that confidence and that courage that they need to seek? Maybe, yeah, Anju? So if uh, I, we talk about the access or, and the community, so uh, yes, uh, an, exclus an exclusive space. So uh, online, uh, an online platform like uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter, it's uh, quite exclusive, but we uh, need to more uh, make it this exclusive because uh, uh, as a Dalit women or as a Dalit women collective, what we face on the online space or the uh, uh, on the ground, so it's uh, quite uh, similar. Or uh, because uh, on the ground also we face uh, so many uh, backlash and uh, barriers, and same at the same time we are facing uh, backlash and the barriers on the online platform. So it's need to be more exclusive and more safe space, in both uh, in the ground and the um, online spaces. I think one of the biggest battles we won in this country is the battle over net neutrality. And I think that we do need to think about the greatest possible access for the greatest possible number of people. And to think about this access in ways that we create, try to create an infrastructure. I'm not a tech person, but I think that on the streets, one of the things we kept saying when we were talking about loitering is what we need is street lighting, public transport 24-7, clean, well-lit public toilets. And my question to the internet and people who work with the internet is what is the equivalent of this? What is the equivalent of clean, well-lit public toilets available 24-7 online that allows more and more people, accessible toilets, that more and more people can, can use? And how do we see this to, to sort of imagine a feminist internet which is even more inviting, it already is. As much as it is full of risks and d dangers, as Shreya suggested, it's a very, very inviting space for marginal citizens, for women, for all of us, because it's a space where we find voice. But we also find a great deal of retribution in that space. And, and we really need to think about how we can improve the infrastructure. The, re the retribution is not going away anytime soon. The hate speech is not going. But can we create an infrastructure that allows access, that allows reporting, that allows us to be there with the anticipation of more and more pleasure and relatively less threat? And, and just before we go, um, we, go to, we go to you, Shrey. I mean, from a Facebook point of view, we are absolutely proactive in terms of having content reviewers, zero tolerance when it comes to intimidation and hate speech and, 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 and exclusion. And I think, you know, this is an important narrative that we need to continue and continue in consultation, in, in listening groups, taking it not only to from urban but to, to, to rural communities as well. Um, I, I think uh, I'd like to flip your question a little bit. So I go back to the writer Kavita Punjabi, who said in a very, uh, very, very important essay, uh, because I think the question you asked was about diversity, right, in a sense. Um, and Kavita's answer to that is, uh, we need to decolonize and not diversify, because when you're speaking from the point of diversity, you're assuming that there's a central power that can grant some kind of, uh, whereas, you know, movements are already organizing online. It's a question of really, stepping back and paying attention to them. Movements have already existed for decades in this country by the most marginalized people, and they have come online. Because as soon as you have access, you, you come, you know, you automatically form those spaces. Like with Me Too, our offline whisper networks that women had between each other about certain men, they came online. So it's exactly the same. As our hierarchies are replicated, so too are our resistances. Um, and uh, thank you for saying what you said about Facebook's policies, because I find that uh, social media platforms in, in uh, general, I think, need to sit down with activists and with communities to understand why it is that we find that the spaces uh, maybe don't listen to us as much as we want them to. When we report abuse, what is the institutional response to that? And that is something, it's a really big conversation that we need to be having for the internet to be a safer space for everyone. Um, yeah, so community standards and, and, you know, what is reported and how it's dealt with is a big part of that. 
But my central point is that these conversations are already happening. Nothing can stop them. Uh, the responsibility of the privileged user, and this changes lens. Like, an able-bodied person may also be Dalit, but also a disabled person may be Savarna. So, it's not a. It's a very nuanced conversation. But to really step back when when it's not your space to speak up, and to really listen to the conversations that's been happening for decades, honestly. And as long as there are people with power and people who don't have power, this will this will continue. And this is why we need to just absolutely um, enforce. Uh, th this structure, this structure, so it is fun, so it is diverse, so that we do listen um, and that we do make sure that everybody is included. D does anybody have any questions before we, f before we finish? No. Questions? Bell hands? Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for joining us today and thank you for being part of We The Women. Thank you very much to all our panelists and Shelley for taking us through a difficult, complex conversation with such finesse. Thank you so much.